quite aware of what they're going through. Ch -ch -ch Changes. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. We're so glad that you can join us for some changes from our state legislature uh, with our wonderful presenter, Darren Davidson. I do just have a couple of announcements. And first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Allison O'Connor. I'm the horticulture specialist in Larimer County. I am my co-pilot today is Tony Kosky, who's a turf specialist and will be behind the scenes addressing questions and posting things in the chat for information. Um, and then Darren will be our presenter who I will introduce in just one brief moment. So just to let you know, CSU is an equal opportunity access and non-discrimination university. If there is anything we can do to accommodate your needs, please let us know. You can uh, reach out, you can go to the website for more information. And this webinar is being recorded. And so if you need to leave or you have a power outage, just know that you can catch this recording at the Plant Talk Colorado website, which we will put into the chat momentarily. Uh, you can also find recorded webinars. You can find information that's coming up on our cohorts blog, as well as Plant Talk. We're kind of transitioning things around, uh, but we'll put both of those links into the chat for you. And we do these every Wednesday on the second, not every Wednesday, the second Wednesday at noon every month. And so next month on April 10th, Dr. Kosky, We'll be talking about clover lawns and organic, organic lawn care. So if those are two topics of interest to you, you can register, scan the QR code. We'll put the registration link in the chat for you. Uh, but please join us on April 10th. And without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce my very good coworker, Darren Davidson. She is the Sustainable Landscape Specialist for Colorado and has a wealth of information. Um, we're so ex excited to have her here. She's going to talk topic, water, legislature. Anyway, the jokes are bad, but Darren is wonderful. So without further ado, Darren, please take it away. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. So give me just a second. All right, is everybody seeing what they should be seeing? Yes. All right, excellent. Um, as Allison said, my name is Darren Davidson. Um, I've been with Extension for, I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary actually, which is exciting. Um, and I am, so I, I work as the sustainable landscape state specialist. Uh, formerly I was a horticulture uh, specialist and um, I am not a policy expert, um, but in my new position, because I support folks at the state level, I definitely track and I follow all of this legislation that's been being passed recently. And there's quite a bit that's been coming up. Um, so I've also been consulted a bit when bills were being drafted. Oftentimes the legislatures, they legislators know, you know, I'm hearing from my constituents and water providers that we need to tackle this issue, but they're not experts. And so they will, they will reach out to people and um, try to learn as much as they can before they put these bills forth. So what my aim with this webinar is to help kind of demystify some of the recent legislation that's been passed concerning landscapes. Um, they are not written in easy to understand language by any means. Um, I did consult with a policy analyst. Um, and even in our conversations, we were sort of confusing each other around some things. So just know you're not alone um, if you've had any confusion around this. So hopefully um, this will help shed some light on these things for you. So um, 
first of all, if we just start with the question, you know, why do we want to be water wise? Why is this, why is all this legislation being passed? Perhaps it's obvious, um, but I think it's good to look at where we live. We're in the semi-arid, high desert climate. We don't get a lot of natural precipitation here. Um, we're mostly urban, certainly along the Front Range, though um, not all by any means. Excuse me, just a second. I'm getting over a cold, so I have to cough every once in a while. Um, <clears throat> most landscapes here do require some sort of irrigation system. Even when we have zero scape and very dry landscapes, a lot of times our, our, um, our landscapes need a little bit of supplemental irrigation. So we want to be mindful of how much water we're putting down. And then also we have lots of other important things to do with the water that we do have, like drink it, cook with it, bathe, etc. So I'm going to go into a little bit of where our water comes from, <coughs> how it's used, how it's allocated, just to kind of frame things out and, and get kind of a picture of water in Colorado. And then we'll start, or we'll start talking about some of these different bills. I will say, um, I think I'm covering four, maybe five different bills that have been passed in the last five, six years. Um, and I will stop at the end of every one to see if there are any clarifying questions. Um, and I'll do my best. Like I said, I did a deep dive into this. I already had some pretty decent understanding. Um, and so between Tony, Allison, and I, we'll, we'll do our best to answer those questions. So, okay, where does our water come from in Colorado? Obviously, we're a landlocked state. Um, we get about 83% of it from precipitation, and that's going to be from snowpack up in the mountains and rain, and then groundwater. So um, a lot of our precipitation makes it into um, rivers and streams, and it um, is surface water, but then we have about 17% groundwater. So you can see that little graphic uh, on the bottom left there, groundwater fills the space between soil particles and rock beneath the Earth's surface. And so if you've heard of water tables, if you have a high or a low water table, that is determined by where that groundwater hits, how, how high it is. Now, how do we access this water that we get? Well, again, lots of precipitation moves into our rivers. We are a headwater state. So if you see all of those uh, squiggly lines on there, um, that's... We just we have tons and tons of rivers and creeks, and it's absolutely amazing because of our position uh, geogra uh, geographically and geologically. We've got our big, big mountains, and all of those rivers um, start there. So we have 158 rivers that flow through Colorado. Only two of those do not actually have headwaters in Colorado. They just they kind of dip into Colorado and then move back out. So 156 rivers that start in Colorado. We have four regional watersheds that origin, originate in the mountains. You can see there the Arkansas, the Colorado, the South Platte, and the Rio Grande River basins. Now what's interesting is more of that water that we have leaves the state than stays in the state. So you can see in that um, image there, again, it, uh, we've got the different river basins broken up, and you can see where the um, where the rivers are going. Can Al? Can people see my cursor if I'm moving it around? I can never. Remember. Uh, yes, they can. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we see here along the middle of the the state. Of course, that's the Continental Divide, and where our mountains. Um, peak. And so this side is the Front Range, and any river that starts on this side moves eastward, and any river that starts on the west side, of course, moves west. So, for instance, um, you can see the Colorado River. That is a huge river. Lots and lots of other rivers and streams feed into that, and a boatload of water leaves the state through the Colorado River. So about 60% of water is consumed by downstream users in other states. So over half of the water that originates in Colorado. And again, particularly when we look at the Colorado River, that's a lot of water leaving the state. Uh, I have a little anecdotal story. I grew up in Fort Collins. So of course my river was the Poudre River. My husband grew up in Arizona. So his river was the Colorado River. 
Uh, we were on a trip. We were driving through Rocky Mountain National Park um, many years ago. And we just, unbeknownst to us, we're just hopping out and getting out at different points. And we're at the Continental Divide. And there's a spot where you can actually see where, basically where the Poudre River starts and it flows one way and where the Colorado River starts and it flows the other way. And so we were just so excited that we were both, we could both be at the headwaters of our um, sort of childhood rivers. Okay, now when we're talking about the Colorado River and how much water that is, it's important to know a little history. So the Colorado River Compact of 1922 divided the river into two basins. I said 60% of the, of the water from Colorado, not just the Colorado River, but all of Colorado is used by other states. So with the Colorado River Compact, the upper basin, which is Colorado, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming was established, and the lower basin, which is Arizona, California, and Nevada. So all of these states got together, created this compact, basically divided up the water that's coming out of Colorado, the Colorado River, and allocated it to these different states. So it established the allotment for each basin and kind of provided a framework for the management of this river into the future. It's important to note that when this agreement uh, or when this agreement was made, it was following a particularly wet period. And this really misled the signatories into believing that more water was gonna be available moving forward uh, than actually was. So you can see, these seven states are dividing up, based on the compact, five, uh, four point, excuse me, 5.4 trillion gallons when the actual river uh, flow is around 4 trillion gallons. So I don't think you have to be super good at math to understand that we've got an issue here. We're promising more water to these other states than the river actually carries. This is a historical agreement, is a binding legal obligation with other states, so um, absolutely something that we had to follow. Now, in 2023, sorry, I think that's actually supposed to be 2022, um, the River Compact was revisited. We needed to kind of uh, figure out, you know, how we were going to go moving forward. Water amounts changed, population growth has boomed, obviously. Um, and so it was revisited and um, decided upon, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe I do have my dates right. I think that the conversation started in 2022, and then as of May 2023, uh, California, Nevada, and Arizona reached an agreement that together they would aim to cut their water use by at least, <laughs> excuse me, 3 million acre feet through the end of 2026. So everybody's realizing, okay, we don't have endless water. We all need to have this concerted effort to try to use less water. So that was agreed upon just last year. And now all of the seven states have to go back and work on a, a longer term deal um, that's going to hopefully start in 2027. And they're going to plan, <clears throat> excuse me, for the next 20 years. So it's one of those things that has to keep being revisited over and over and over, though you can see <clears throat> that the original compact was not revisited for 100 years. It just stood the same. Um, it is important to note that, um, you know, there are like Nevada is in there. And of course, people think of Las Vegas. Um, so Las Vegas has seen a huge increase in people since about 2020, uh, 2002. Um, but they've also been successful in cutting their Colorado River consumption by about 31%. Um, so it is possible to still grow your population um, and use less water. You just have to be th very thoughtful about it. They've had some really extreme um, policies and regulations in place to, um, to be able to do that. It's not going to work for every state or every city, but it is possible. We just have to be mindful about these things. So clearly water is a precious resource. Um, being in Colorado, you know, we, we feel like, oh, we have all this water, but we don't actually have a ton of water to uh, use for ourselves. But it's important to know that switching to more water thrifty landscapes, you know, cutting back on our water use, it's a, it's a great practice. And I think that we should do it but it's not going to fix our water, water, any water shortage issues alone. 
So while we do put a lot of drinking potable water on our landscape, agriculture is still the biggest user of water. You can see about 86% of our water goes to ag. It's about 7% for municipal use, all municipal use, and about 3% of that is going to outdoor water use. So it's one of those things where um, in the overall picture, it's it's a relatively small amount, but there's absolutely still a role for wa landscape water reduction. Every drop counts. You know, if we can be a part of the solution, then that's fantastic. <clears throat> and when we have community efforts, that's when they really add up. So this is why cities, counties, and the state are trying to are starting to put in these regulations um, and policies to kind of help people push people into using less water on their landscape. But We've got to remember, you know, <clears throat> there there is an answer where we could say, well, let's just not have outdoor landscapes. So let's just not water anything. Then, you know, problem solved. But our landscapes are so, so important, right? So water is clearly important. Our landscapes also contribute so much to our overall health and well-being. They help urban air quality, help mitigate pollution. Um, choosing the right plants help with stormwater management, Obviously, we can be creating wildlife and pollinator habitat. Green spaces are going to lower urban heat islands, which is really key. Um, as we have more development, build more buildings, pave more roads, our urban heat island increases because we're creating these um, areas of high thermal mass where buildings and sidewalks and streets absorb water. Uh, excuse me, they do not absorb water. They absorb heat and then they radiate that heat back out at night and it just makes the overall area hotter. Um, tons of outdoor recreation and relaxation for people with our outdoor landscapes, whether it's parks or home landscapes. And then beautifying our spaces, there's absolutely benefit to that, provides a sense of calm and well-being. And then we can also celebrate our sense of place and, and why Colorado is such a beautiful uh, place. So, um, you know, every once in a while you hear from people that say, oh, let's just go to zero scaping, just rocks that we're not using the water. Uh, that would be awful. It would be super hot. It would be super dry. It would be super ugly. So we can have our landscapes, they can be beautiful, and we can be conscientious about our water use. So how do we protect both water and landscapes? We can choose water-wise gardening and landscape practices. So we want to plan for water efficiency. We want to choose appropriate plants. It's super important to learn um, about our individual irrigation systems and make sure they're running correctly. Uh, lots of people, lots of homeowners and renters can cut back on their water use a lot if they are aware of how their irrigation is running. Um, people have leaks and cracks and inefficient heads and they don't realize it. So if you can get a good understanding of how your irrigation system works, that could potentially save you thousands of gallons of water every year. Um, we have, CSU Extension has some great fact sheets on how to um, sort of learn and understand and maintain your irrigation system. It's important to learn about our soils and how that holds water, what happens with water in our soils. We can use mulch on our landscapes. So a good thick layer of mulch is gonna help keep uh, water in our soils and not just evaporating out. And then, so those are these are all things that we can do as individuals. And then sometimes cities, counties, and the state decide that they wanna help support these efforts. Um, and that is what we're gonna get into now. <clears throat> so we can have beautiful um, gardens like this. I will say this uh, presentation is very heavy on text and legal jargon. So I'm interspersing some pretty plant pictures for everybody um, just to give our eyes a little bit of a break, but we can have beautiful landscapes like this, but every once in a while the state and the cities come in and they decide we need to pass a bill. So what bills are we gonna talk about? We're gonna go all the way back to 2016 and briefly touch on the rainwater collection bill. We're gonna talk about uh, one that was passed in 2019, encouraging the use of Xeriscape. We're going to talk about the more recent 2020 1151 turf replacement program. We're going to talk about the one that passed last year, uh, Waterwise Landscaping and HOAs. That one has caused quite a bit of confusion. Um, and then there's a new one that was just 
um, sent to the governor's office yesterday uh, to be signed into law prohibiting landscaping practices for water conservation. So we're going to sort of tease apart all of these different ones. So first of all, I said these things are not written in easy to understand language. So here's the actual act for House Bill 161005. So this is the rainwater collection one. So you can see all this jargon and sections and provisions and amendments. And then finally you get to the signatures. So this isn't really good bedtime reading, right? So let's try to pick it apart a little bit. So this is the residential precipitation collection bill concerning the use of rain barrels to collect precipitation from a residential rooftop for non-potable outdoor uses. So first we have to mention that Colorado is a water rights state. So what does that mean? If you're not aware, uh, because we are a headwater state and because we have so much water, <laughs> excuse me, uh, way back when, when the state was being established, water rights were also established. So Colorado has uh, a water court, a wa water lawyers, there's a whole water system, and we ha ha people own water rights. And at its very basic uh, explanation, uh, there's much more to it than what I'm going to tell you. Water that falls from the sky and hits the ground is is instantly owned by someone who owns water rights. So the concern and why um, water collection in rain barrels has not been legal prior to 2016 was because it was thought that if you were holding water on your site in a barrel, then you were taking somebody else's water. You were basically essentially stealing that water from the downstream user. Um, CSU conducted a study that showed that there would be no significant impact to those downstream users and water rights holders, so this was passed. A maximum of two rain barrels can be uh, on site at any given time, and those two can have a combined storage capacity of 110 gallons. It's important to note that these can only be put, uh, the water can only be taken from rooftops of a building that's used primarily as a single family residence or multifamily residence with four or fewer units. Um, we're not supposed to be doing this off of garages or sheds. Has to be used on residential property that the precipitation is collected. So you're not collecting it and taking it down the street or to another property. And the water needs to be used, um, applied to outdoor purposes such as lawn irrigation and gardening. Um, sometimes people say, can I water my house plants? Can I wash my car? They kept it kind of vague and they said, just use it outside on things like irrigation. Um, I have those words in teeny tiny letters there because it's not that important. It's about enforcement and the uh, state engineer. But what is important in section three is that homeowners association, um, HOAs are not allowed to prohibit prohibit people from using rain barrels, they can uh, impose what they call reasonable aesthetic requirements. So they can uh, dictate where you might put it or what it looks like, but they cannot stop you from having a rain barrel. So here are a couple pictures of different kinds. Um, so that's it. That's the rain barrel bill. Any questions on that? We doing okay, Allison? Thumbs up. Okay, I'm going to keep going ahead. And if you do think of a question, I know Tony and Allison are, are answering as we go, and then uh, we can always get to them at the end. Okay, House Bill 191050. This is encouraging the use of zero escape in common areas. And then you can sort of see the little subtext there concerning the promotion of water efficient landscaping on property subject to management by local supervisory entities. My goodness, nobody actually speaks like that, right? Uh, so if we look at this, the importance here is that this is property that is um, under management by um, common interest communities like HOAs. So there was an existing law, um, and this is um, this is just adding to it that uh, you can there the homeowners, unit owners have the right in HOAs to use Xeriscape, basically. 
Um, they always throw in wording like subject to reasonable aesthetic standards. It's a really hard thing to enforce. It's a really hard thing to say, well, you know, who's aesthetics, right? Because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but the idea is that you can't be stopped from, in an HOA, you can't be stopped from doing uh, zero escapes. And this can go to uh, common elements, which are owned by the community. So like an HOA kind of common space. Um, and then um, homeowners are, are allowed to do that too. So that that's a pretty short one, pretty basic one. Here's another pretty picture of plants. Ah, oh, we can just rest our eyes for a minute, especially as we have this impending big snowstorm. I'm down in the Longmont area. We're supposed to get, I think, 10 or 12 inches over the next day and a half. Um, but soon we'll be seeing gardens like this. Okay, moving on to House Bill 221151. This is the turf replacement program. Um, there was a lot of interest in this one. This is the cash for grass program. So again, if I read through there, concerning measures to incentivize waterwise landscapes and in connection therewith, creating a state program to finance the voluntary replacement of irrigated turf and make an appropriation. So basically what that means is incentivizing the removal of turf to replace it with um, low water use plants. And the state has to make uh, has to allocate money toward that. And it's a completely voluntary program. So it's not saying that anybody has to do this, but the state is going to make some money available um, to support this. So again, they're providing a financial incentive for the voluntary replacement of irrigated turf. Um, the act defines water-wise landscaping as water and plant management practices that emphasize using plants with lower water needs. So again, not super specific, just low water use plants. Um, we've got lots of great options for that. Um, it's also important to know that um, a lot of cities already have this kind of program. And so this was meant to sort of fill in the gaps among cities that don't have their, their own buyback programs. Um, and uh, we also have, there are also local governments, certain districts, Native American tribes, and nonprofit organizations that have turf, turf replacement programs, um, and they can also apply for this money. So here's, here's how much money. Um, the state treasurer was required to transfer $2 million to the turf replacement fund, which they did. Um, again, this was in 2022. When you see HB 22, the 22 is the year. So it's House Bill passed in 2022. Um, realistically, $2 million sounds like a lot, but when you're talking about the whole state, it's not that much. Um, but it was allocated to this program. And um, it's, it's individuals cannot apply for the funding. It comes through water providers or other rebate programs. So it's not something that we can just go out as an individual and say, hey, I want that cash for grass program. It's, you know, check with your water provider, check with your city, check with your local area. One thing to note with cash for grass programs is there are definitely some issues. So people get excited. They think, hey, I can get some money for this. Um, I wasn't using that turf area anyway. They rip out their turf, but they don't have a plan. You don't want to do really anything with your landscape if you don't have at least some sort of a plan. Because if you take out all your turf, you're left with bare soil. This is a prime area for weeds to move in. You get a heavy rain. You're going to have a muddy mess. Your soil is going to get compacted. It can create a lot of headaches. So just a word of caution. Um, if you're going to take advantage of something like this, you want to have a plan. So you've removed or reduced your lawn. Now what? You've got to be thinking through these things. It's really, really important. Um, you don't have to have a complete plan in mind, but you want to time things such that you're going to have um, the capacity, the time, the ability to put something else in relatively quickly. Uh, because again, if you just have a big open area, um, you're going to cause yourself lots and lots of headaches. And when this started happening and when these sorts of rebate programs started taking place, we were seeing that people are like, ah, now what do I do? a lot harder to kind of, you know, catch up to that than it is to just take the time, make a plan, 
figure out, do I want to remove all my turf? Do I just want to remove part of it? That sort of thing. So um, that house bill uh, was that state level um, $2 million allocated to water providers and other organizations. But there are also a lot of city programs. I'm not going to be able to go through all of them, but it is important to know because it seems that um, sometimes people have this, uh, there are things going on in their city, but they're not aware of it, or they're going to move somewhere and they're not aware of it. Um, so a lot of the city um, regulations that are coming through are based on the Colorado River Basin Municipal and Public Water Providers Memorandum of Understanding. So they got together, um, I think it was 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, and basically they sort of like the Colorado River Compact, they got together and they said, hey, what are we gonna do to use less water? Um, so you can see those bullet points. They say, we're gonna continue and expand our programs to increase indoor and outdoor water use efficiency. So indoor, you know, things like uh, low flow toilets and, you know, doing audits and that sort of thing. But they also wanted to introduce programs to reduce the qual uh, quantity of non-functional turf grass by 30%. So that is the key. This uh, memo that they, uh, memorandum of understanding that they came together and all signed on. Um, and I think there were, I don't remember how many people signed on to it. Denver Water was one, City of Aurora, several different um, uh, folks throughout Colorado signed on to this. So then they started creating their own programs to support that. So for example, uh, the City of Aurora, um, in 2022, they were one of the first to kind of jump on this. They pr it, uh, it prohibits turf for aesthetic purposes in new and redeveloped areas and in front yards. So that's new development or something's being redone. Um, then backyard turf is limited to 45% of the space or 500 square feet, whichever is smaller. And you'll see they're all kind of variations on the same theme. City of Castle Rock. Um, went all in on this and they they created a whole manual um, that I'll explain about in a minute here. But as of January 1st last year, any home that was permitted and built, so new builds after January 1st, 2023, required the builder to install a Colorado scape with no turf in the front yard. So no, no turf in the front yard and the landscape can be uh, 500 square feet or less in the backyard. So individuals are not held to this. It's new developments, people that are building new homes. Um, so we all probably know and have heard of Xeriscape, but Colorado Scape is starting to make the rounds. Um, and I've seen different definitions of this, um, but here's Castle Rock's definition. A natural landscape comprised of low to very low water use plant material, which blends in with the native Castle Rock landscape. Uh, combines hardscape, landscape materials, and provides a variety of colors, te textures, sizes, shapes, and seasonal interest. That sounds great, right? When you're doing a landscape design, those are the kinds of things that you want. They're just really trying to promote the use of xeric and native plants in that. Um, Allison, I don't know if uh, you've shared it, but I did send an email. If people are interested, City of Castle Rock partnered with Norris Design, which is a landscape architecture firm, um, and they created this whole manual and guideline and their designs in there and stuff. It's kind of a fun thing to look through and just sort of get some ideas. Um, city and County of Broomfield, Fort Collins and Grand Junction all have new, um, new codes and landscape ordinances. Broomfield as of January 1st this year, similar to the others, only allowed turf grass on 30% of front and side yards. And again, there are these nuances front and side yards, not just backyards or not just front yards. Um, and then Broomfield also said that new irrigation systems have to have rain shutoff sensors and they, there can be no turf in parking lot landscapes. So everybody's kind of taking their own approach, um, but, but thinking through this stuff. Fort Collins, um, I believe they're still working on their landscape ordinances, but they have similar restrictions as Broomfield in new home construction, no more than 30% turf. And then Grand Junction, also working on new codes. Um, they've got turf restrictions, and then they're also providing homeowners with low water use landscape designs. So that's something that's becoming more and more um, common, I would say, is that, you know, 
water providers, cities, et cetera, are not just saying you can't do it. They're also trying to provide uh, education and solutions. Uh, if you haven't heard of Resource Central, they have a great garden in a box program. And they sort of, you know, they're all about uh, low water use stuff and, and using less water. They've got lots of water conservation and efficiency um, programs, but one of them is Garden in a Box. Um, I know this is, text is kind of little, but if you look through the, the three columns there, those are the cities around the state that they, um, that they partner with. And they also partner with uh, water providers. And if you are in one of these cities, when you go to order your garden in a box, um, there's a chance that you can get a $25, uh, $25 discount on your garden that you choose. So if you're not familiar with garden in a box, it's a program um, where you choose your garden in a box. And it's sort of like a paint by number. It has the design, you pick up your plants, and then you can just plant them right in the ground. And you know that it's going to hopefully look good. So you can see lots of cities and towns there. So they are, they are kind of a rebate program, um, but they, uh, again, partner so that you can have that plan in place, not just remove your turf, but have a plan in place for what you're going to put in its place. Um, it is interesting to note that Denver Water um, doesn't have a cash for grass program, and they outline this in their material. And they've found that through their efficiency programs, through conservation programs, and through partnerships in education, they're seeing significant progress in reducing um, outdoor water use among their uh, customers. And so they're, they're seeing that property owners are taking their own steps to transform their landscapes, and they've decided it's working for them. They don't need to do the cash for grass programs. So um, just kind of a different take, a different approach. Any questions about all of that before we go to the next one? No questions, Darren, but we're keeping up with the chat. So if people don't have their chat on, make sure that you're looking at the links we're providing and you can bookmark those for later. Well, thank you. Okay, everyone's favorite, if you've heard about it, Senate Bill 23-178. This is the Waterwise Landscaping in Homeowners Association Communities. This bill around, there has been so much confusion around this one. Um, it's just worded in a way that is confusing. Some of the stipulations are sort of open-ended and don't have um, hard and fast answers around them. So this one has this one has been really confusing. Um, this one is concerning removing barriers to waterwise landscaping in common interest communities. Again, a common interest community is uh, an HOA basically. Um, <clears throat> so where I think a lot of the breakdown is happening with this one is that um, HOAs are are being held accountable for something. Uh, and of course, HOAs have, have landscape boards and those people turn over. When you get a different set of people, they might have a different opinion on how to do things. Um, and they don't necessarily want to be held accountable to certain things, but there are these stipulations in this bill that they are. So um, under this current law, I think what's important here is that HOAs may not prohibit the use of Xeriscape non-vegetative turf grass or drought tolerant vegetative landscapes to provide ground cover to property for which a unit owner is responsible. So again, blah, what does that mean? HOAs cannot prohibit low water use landscaping on someone's home. You know, if somebody chooses to do that, an HOA can't say, nope, we think it's ugly, you're not allowed to do that. That whole, you know, in, in those other bills that we looked at, there was the reasonable, um, has to be reasonably aesthetic or whatever. Um, there is an exception that authorizes the HOA to adopt and enforce design or aesthetic guidelines or rules that apply to these areas, um, specifically to regulate the type, the number, and the placement of these plantings and hardscapes. So that's a really tricky one. That puts, that really kind of pits homeowners and HOAs against each other. 
Um, so they, while they can't prohibit zero escape and low water landscapes, they can sort of dictate how it's done. So that's, that's the vagueness there is pretty tricky. Um, the act states these different things. And here's what I think is important to uh, pay attention to. Um, the association guidelines and rules must not prohibit Again, they can't prohibit the use of non-vegetative turf grass in the backyard. Um, they may not unreasonably require the use of hardscape on more than 20% of the landscaping area. Uh, they must allow homeowners an option that consists of at least 80% drought tolerant planting. So 80% is a lot. And they may not prohibit veggie gardens in the front, back, or side yard of a unit's, of a, of a homeowner's property. So they cannot prohibit the use of these things in the backyard. They may not unreasonably require um, hardscape on more than 20% of the yard. They have to allow people uh, an option that consists of 80% drought tolerant plantings. And they can, basically they cannot prohibit veggie gardens front, back, or side. There's more. There's more to it. <laughs> uh, so in this one, this is another point of confusion. So the act requires that the HOA has to develop at least three garden designs that the HOA approves of for installation in front yards. And the garden design must adhere to the principle of water-wise landscaping or be part of a water conservation program. So a lot of places, uh, I'm gonna list off a few, have um, for public consumption have designs like Resource Central kind of with their garden in a box. That's a design. Um, Plant Select, Northern Water, I'm going to go through others. They have these designs available on their website. Um, the plants have similar, you know, sun exposure needs, similar water use. They're going to look good together. Uh, the plants are, should be available to people. So HOAs can use those and say, okay, homeowners, we like, it's a minimum of three, which to me is not very many. If you have, you know, an HOA of 200 homes and you only have three landscapes, landscape design options, um, it's going to get kind of boring. Um, but um, they have to provide at least three that they say, okay, homeowners, if you want to switch out your stuff to zero escape, we can't, or low water use, we can't stop you, but you have to choose one of these three. So that's the rub there. Now... Um, here are some of those options. So in the bill, they actually call out CSU extension and plant select as having these designs. So I just pulled this. This is just a screenshot off their website, um, free water wise landscape designs. And again, this is something that they already had. They've had them for years and years. There are far more than what you see there. If you go to this page and just scroll, there are lots and lots of options. Um, Northern Water just created sustainable landscape templates. Um, this was really driven by um, the um, results of the Marshall Fire. They partnered with, again, with Norris Design. I said that Castle Rock partnered with Norris Design. So Northern Water also partnered with Norris um, and community stakeholders there. And they created six scalable landscape designs that are going to be uh, low water use. It's going to take fire uh, mitigation and design guidelines into consideration. So they worked with the zones one through three. Um, so again, another option potentially for those. And then uh, city of Denver, or I mean, Denver Water has different plans. Here's an example of one of theirs. So those are just three, Plant Select, Northern Water, Denver Water. I think Colorado Springs Utilities might have them. I'm sure there are places on the West Slope. So these are just some examples, but it's this kind of thing that an HOA can choose from to say, okay, yes, we approve these to be used in our, uh, in our HOA if people want to do this switch. Now, uh, homeowners have a little bit of, um, uh, what do you call it? Like a little bit of of um, recourse, I guess. Uh, so if if an HOA violates this the act's requirements, a homeowner can pr provide the HOA of notice of the, put this in, you're not providing me with the three designs. 
Um, so if they provide notice and a 45 day period for the HOA to fix things, um, they can actually bring a civil action um, to restrain further violation and recover up to $500 um, or actual damages, whichever, whichever is greater. I'm not totally clear. This is, I was talking to the policy analyst about this before doing the presentation. Um, I'm not exactly clear on what those um, damages or costs could be, um, why those costs would be occurred, but it could be something like somebody thought they were following the rules, they used one of the designs, they installed it, and then the HOA like told them that they have to stop work for some reason, and then they're out money, or said that they had to remove some of the landscape, you know, things like that can happen. So um, if you are on an HOA board, um, I think it's important to, you know, pay attention to, well, pay attention to this, obviously, but understand that people aren't trying to, um, probably, I can't speak for everybody, not trying to, you know, make things um, ugly or, you know, not not follow an, a, a certain aesthetic, um, but simply trying to provide pollinator habitat, use less water, um, you know, so you don't want to, I don't, I don't know why people would want to get in there and really try to stop people from doing this sort of thing. Um, but we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of tension around that. Um, so anyway, the homeowners do have some recourse if things like this happen. Um, now, again, the Act's provisions apply only to single family homes, um, not uh, like condos or townhouses. There has actually been an amendment since this was passed to also include those. Ooh, okay, another pretty picture. Let's rest our eyes. Let's look at some green and some color. Um, okay, and then we're going to move into the last one. Um, uh, well, second to last one, but these last ones are... No, this is the last one, I think. Um, okay, so this is Senate Bill 24105. This is the one that I said was just sent to the governor's office yesterday. Um, so when you look online, because it hadn't been fully signed into law yet... Um, they still have some of the um, uh, adjustments, the new wording, but this is prohibiting landscaping practices for water conservation concerning the conservation of water in the state through the prohibition of certain landscaping practices. Again, it's jargony. What exactly does that mean? So you can see here, um, there are things that are struck through and then there are things that are italicized. So um, all of the words on there that are not italicized are the original bill as it was written. Um, and then these amendments were made um, after going through the different sessions. Uh, so as it stands now, this is the verbiage that is being sent to the governor's office. So on and after January 1st of not 2025, but 2026, um, um, the bill prohibits, so prohibits local governments from allowing the installation, planting, or placement of non-functional turf, artificial turf, or invasive plant species on commercial, institutional, or industrial property. Um, parking lots, medians, or transportation corridors. Um, so it also prohibits uh, the Department of Personnel um, from allowing the installation of, this, of all of this. So when we talk about non-functional turf, um, again, that's pretty vague. Who is saying that it's non-functional? We don't have somebody that's going around and, you know, was given the authority and the power to say that's functional, that's not functional. Um, all turf is going to provide some function, carbon sequestration. It's going to help water infiltrate um, soil. It's holding soil and stopping it uh, from uh, soil erosion, that sort of thing. But what they're really getting to is if nobody's, you know, out there using it, sports aren't being played on it, people aren't sitting on it in a park, then perhaps it's non-functional. So they're really trying to limit people from putting turf in areas that aren't going to be used. Um, they don't want artificial turf to be put in place. And then, of course, invasive plant species. That's That seems like I kind of can't believe that that had to actually be written in, quite frankly, but it's good that they don't want invasive species to be um, added in there. So, uh, again, this one is brand new, still uh, being signed in. Oops. So, 
wrapping up. There's lots of jargon. I think that all of this, you know, trying to do good, trying to address um, the issues of water use and and uh, limit our water use. But really, I think, you know, it's us, uh, it's up to us, like Denver Water said, you know, they're seeing their residents really um, kind of make their own shift, use less water on their own. Um, let's use some common sense. Let's choose plants appropriately. Really make sure you understand your irrigation system. That's going to help a lot. And then make sure that you're enjoying your landscape and all that it provides because they are so beneficial to us. Um, whether you have a patch of turf for um, and it's absolutely being used or if you're just purely xeric rock garden, whatever it is, um, they all add value to our lives and our properties. So um, we want to we want to do what's right for us. We also want to do what's right for the environment. And we also want to try to follow the rules of all of these different bills. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I think we have a few minutes. If I can answer any questions, I am happy to. Thanks, Darren. I found that to be completely fascinating. And there are a couple questions. And if you can't answer them, what we can do is try to follow up with the individuals themselves. So the first question is, what if the owner doesn't own the front yard and it's technically common area? How does this apply? Or how do some of these bills apply? For the HO for the turf replacement or for the HOA zero escape one? Probably for the HOA zero escape one. That's my guess. But if if the question came from Marie, if you are still on, please just clarify your question. Yeah. Well, and so my first thought is um the zero escape, um, the first one zero escape one that I talked about was about HOA managed properties that uh I, when I don't have all the legal jargon in front of me, I, I can't come up with it, but um, you should still be able to do that. And you should be able to talk to your HOA about that because there are um, clauses in there about um, common interest communities uh, that can uh, unit owners that have property in front of them that is managed by the HOA can still have that zero escape. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule. They might say, no, we're not doing that. Um, but yeah, we can we can look into that a little bit more for you if you want us to. Uh, and Tony, if you're on, it would be wonderful if you could come on and talk a little bit about artificial turf mm -hmm. and why that decision was made, unless Darren, you're comfortable, but we'll, we'll grab the turf specialist while he's here. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah, well, artificial turf for a lot of reasons, although it is interesting, one of the other bills specifically allows installation of synthetic turf in backyards. So there, there's a conflict already between the previous bill and this one, if you read all those bills like I do, and I'm still confused by them. But um, yeah, the synthetic turf, um, it, it really messes with uh, soil health, which is a huge term. But um, uh, it's uh, it, it gets hot. It it, it really inhibits uh, uh, water infiltration. So when it does rain or snow here, uh, it, it negatively impacts water movement into the soil. So you could even make a uh, you know make the point um, that uh, it, it's messing with the hydrology of the water that does fall uh, in the state. Um, but it's. Uh, uh, more recent concerns are about, about microplastics. Um, all synthetic turf is made of plastic. Um, and then infill is often um, uh, uh, ground up rubber tires and there's all kinds of potentially not so good chemistry and chemicals in those, in those infill pro products. Uh, and plus these things, they just don't last very long. So there's breakdown, especially in our climate with the ultraviolet and the weathering in the sun, um, they don't last as long as the companies say they do. So there's potentially just chemically, it, it's just not a natural thing. Um, then you start trying to grow trees and I've got a great picture of a tree that the homeowner killed by having synthetic turf installed around it. So uh, there's really not a whole lot to be said positive about synthetic turf. At first blush, it seems, oh yeah, you don't have to water it. That's got to be great. But when you look at all the other potential downsides, I don't, I don't see how you can 
weigh things in favor of synthetic turf unless you're a company selling it. Um, but don't believe everything they tell you. Thanks, Tony. Darren, if there's a, a neighborhood that has multiple, I want to say like, trying to think of how, like sub HOAs in it. For the landscape design, does it fall to the largest, the overall HOA, or would it fall to the sub HOAs within the neighborhood? Does that make sense what I'm trying to ask? Like um, filings. Yeah, that does make sense. And I don't know. I don't know the answer there. Okay. Good question. Ruth, if you could reach out to Darren or myself, uh, we will check with the uh, contact that Darren has at the state and mm -hmm. see if we can get an answer for you. Good question. Um, yeah, with the last, I, oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that the, the policy analyst that I talk with, he likes getting feedback on all of this because he knows these things are confusing. So yeah, he's more than happy to answer these questions and we can respond. Probably, out. probably depends on how the HOA is set up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I we, would we imagine work, we within with, like their bylaws and stuff, they would kind of determine who has ultimate authority. Exactly. Um, with the latest House bill that is being signed as of this week, does it limit rock as a replacement for yard? So taking out turf, and then what if people rockscape, what goes in? Is there any limitations with that? Okay. Nope. It's I just read about... through that bill, and there, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it prohibits things, but it doesn't right. prohibit rock. Which, right. But then I think that's where... You know, like like the the Fort Collins um, zip, uh, zip program, a certain percent has to be in plant material. So right. they do limit in a replacement program how much rock can be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's going to be a case by case, city by city, especially with the replacement programs. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's why there's so much confusion and so much nuance and. You know, if you have an HOA member that's interpreting it and they think they've landed on the correct interpretation, but a homeowner says, no, this is how I read it. And there isn't really anybody, any one person that you can contact to say, please give me the answer here. Um, <laughs> excuse me. So I know that the state was talking about um, trying to, you know, create fact sheets and provide more clarifying information, but that's why yeah. your questions would be helpful to pass on to them. Yeah. And the Aurora and Castle Rock. Um, mm -hmm. They they require a certain amount of plant cover too, so it can't all be rock, yeah. and it can't be turf, it can't be synthetic, all that kind of stuff. So right, exactly. And they do limit like uh, like twenty. It can't be more than twenty percent hardscape required, and that sort right. of thing. So yeah. So kind of two um, detailed questions. The first is: Are there any programs supporting the actual stuff, the turf you take out and bringing it to? A landfill to a recycling center is there any support for that and then are there any right or not i don't want to say regulations any information on maintenance of these landscapes i love that second question i don't know of support programs for the removal of all the turf there are recommendations um like keep it on site compost it turn it over that sort of thing um Allison or Tony, do you know of any? It, like you, the worst thing is that you just strip it up and like send it to the landfill. That's you know that's not a great use of that. But I I would recommend that if you can somehow leave the turf in place, like if you kill it off and leave it in place, your soil will be much better. Your best soil is mm -hmm. where the turf is living. So mm -hmm. if there are some options there, but no, I don't I don't know of any supporting programs yeah. to help with the removal of stuff. Or where to where to bring it? I know, yeah, I know that. Um, so Resource Central, I talked about Garden in a Box. They also have a, a turf removal program um, where they will come in and have somebody actually remove your turf. And they were having issues figuring out. It was such a pop, or it is such a popular program, um, and they were scaling it so much that they were having to brainstorm and figure out what to do with all of the turf that they were removing, um, and look for local you know, places to take it and that sort of thing. So yeah, it, that is an important question. And then the maintenance, um, I don't exactly remember what the question was, but understanding the maintenance and doing the maintenance is super key. So I would say 
attending these webinars, um, you know, taking classes, reading up, um, understanding how to take care of your new uh, landscape is definitely important because if you do all of this work, um, you transition your your landscape and then you're unable to maintain it or you don't understand how, and then you know it can it can sort of become a fail quickly if you're um, if it's not doing what you want it to do. And every landscape tape takes maintenance, even if it's you know it it's, appears to be the most the lowest maintenance landscape around. There's still going to be some maintenance, and so understanding what that's going to take is is really important. So extension provides lots of classes that include information like that. And so what we'll do, we're at our hour. So Darren, is it okay if I put your email address in the chat if people have questions they want to follow up? Also, this is where you can contact your local extension office. Extension, if you're in Colorado, we serve all 64 counties and so you can reach out. We also have master gardeners who can answer a lot of these questions, especially about specific plants that you might be looking at. Any final words, Darren? Nope, thanks for joining everybody. Hope, hope it helped. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And we'll stay on just to answer some questions. Otherwise, have a great afternoon. Be safe in the upcoming snow.